if like me, you have travelled at all in the east of England, then you'll no doubt be familiar with the smaller country houses with which the, the counties of Norfolk and Suffolk in particular are studded. You know, I mean, they're often rather dank little buildings, usually in the Italian style, and set within parks of some 80 to 100 acres. Now, you see, for me, these properties always held a very strong attraction with their, their grey paling of split oak, the noble trees, the, the mirrors with their reed beds, the line of distant woods. You know, I, I, I like the pillared portico and the hall inside going right up to the roof, which hall, I think, always ought to be provided with a gallery and a small organ. Castringham, the setting for the ash tree, M. R. James's great tale of rural witchcraft, with its hall, mere and church, and its proximity to Bury St. Edmunds, is clearly based on Great Livermere, the Suffolk village to which James's family moved when he was three years old. His father was the vicar of St. Peter's Church until his death in 1909, and both his parents are buried there, on the north of the churchyard. The superbly evocative name of the witch in the story was borrowed from a prominent local family, the Mother Souls. This photograph from 1898 includes the elderly John and Lucy Mother Soul. They seem to be marking a family christening. Gravestones bearing the Mother Soul name can still be seen outside St Peter's today. But there's another landscape from M. R. James's childhood that I think added to the store of history and folklore that he grew up on for the ash tree. And it's a place where he acquired many of the interests that characterise his adult life. And it's here in South East London. When James was 11, he was sent in tears to board at Temple Grove, a prep school in East Sheen, near the edge of Richmond Park. It was reputed to be the oldest private school in England. Nothing survives of the building that James knew. The whole establishment moved to Eastbourne in 1907 and the estate was sold to property developers. Closely packed brick and stucco houses cover the sports fields and the lake that once lay here. James himself was only at Temple Grove for a little over three years. But although it didn't leave a stronger mark upon him as his next school, Eton, the years of early adolescence that he spent in East Sheen were formative. It was at Temple Grove, for instance, that he met fellow pupil Arthur Benson, who would shadow him throughout his life, through Eton and Cambridge, and remain a close, if sometimes rather prickly, friend. It was in the school library that he discovered Lord Curzon's visits to monasteries in the Levant, the book that first stirred his interest in medieval manuscripts, an interest out of which he'd make a distinguished academic career. And the vivid imagination that had been fostered in Livermere continued to develop there. Temple Grove, the very name is suggestive of something out of the Golden Bough, was naturally surrounded by trees. This is Sheen Common, very near the former grounds of the school. Now, in a school story, which Emma James wrote in about 1906, in which he read aloud to the boys of the King's College Choir School, he describes a, a prep school very like Temple Grove. It's clearly based upon his own experiences. It was a great white building, he says, with very fine grounds about it. There were large cedars in the garden and ancient elms in the three or four fields which we used for our games. I think it was probably quite an attractive place, but boys seldom allow that their schools possess any tolerable features. His old school chum, Arthur Benson, also remembered the sylvan surroundings later in life. My idea of East Sheen, he said, is a place of high and secret walls with great trees and solid facades discerned within. And the arboreal theme was reflected, he remembered, in the names of the surrounding mansions, the cedars, the larches, the firs, the plains, the limes, all of which, of course, are now long demolished. But Arthur Benson also recalled 
some more sinister foliage in the grounds of his old school. A dense shrubbery and some little mounds inside with headstones much overgrown with periwinkles. The graves no doubt of dogs, but which in my own mind I believe to be the graves of children, perhaps of boys who died at the school and which I regarded with a mournful pleasure. But there was another tree nearby about which strange rumours and even stranger people circulated. And that was an ash tree. About half a mile from Temple Grove, on the north side of Richmond Park, is Sheen Gate, the main route into the park for those boys of the school, among them M.R. James, who were on snore, that is, whose academic achievements allowed them to travel outside the school grounds on Sundays and half holidays. And close to the gate stood Sheen Lodge, a sizeable house that had been given by Queen Victoria to the great English naturalist Sir Richard Owen in 1852. Owen is perhaps best known today as a founder of the Natural History Museum and for coining the word dinosaur. He lived in the lodge on the edge of the park for 40 years. He died there in 1892 and he was a well-known local figure. Sheen Lodge was irreparably damaged by a German bomb dropped nearby in 1944 and this is all that survives today. But it was once a substantial home with a fine garden that looked over nearby Adam's Pond and the park beyond. And in the middle of this view, just across the pond, was a natural object that must have perplexed and amused the man of science who dwelt in the house. Now, there are still some really splendid old trees, mainly oaks, in Richmond Park, in the vicinity of Adams Pond and the site of Sheen Lodge. But there's nothing that survives today that is quite so magnificent and weird as this. The shrew ash, or the witch ash. Look at that. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Like a doughy lump that slowly sagged over the centuries. This gnarly, cavernous, living coffin with holes in it big enough for at least one cow to have got its head stuck in was probably 300 years old by the time this photograph was taken in 1856. Queen Elizabeth I is said to have sheltered beneath it when hunting deer in the park and it appears to have given the name Ashen Close to the slope of land on which it stood. By the second half of the 19th century, it was looking at age, and it was finally done for by the storms of 1987. But in its day, it was credited with magical properties. Now, the magic that the shrew ash was supposed to work, although secret, was beneficial rather than malign. And unlike Sir Richard Fell in M.R. James's story, who makes clear his contempt for the old hollow ash tree that grows next to Castigam Hall. Sir Richard Owen had almost paternal feelings towards the great bulb of wood that he gazed at every time he looked out of his window. My dear old tree, he called it, and he watched over it for years. But like the fictional Sir Richard's father, Sir Matthew Fell, Sir Richard Owen witnessed curious comings and goings after dark. One morning, not long after he'd moved into the lodge, Sir Richard, an early riser, was walking in the park before sunrise when he saw a young woman carrying an infant approaching the tree, accompanied by an old dame, what he later came to call a shrew mother or witch mother. His account of what happened was reported in an article in the journal Folklore that was published in 1898. They were going straight for the tree, but when they saw Sir Richard, they turned off in quite another direction till they supposed he was out of sight. He, however, struck by their sudden avoidance of him, watched them from a distance, saw them return to the tree 
where they remained some little time as if busily engaged with it, and then they went away. He was too far off to hear anything said, but he did hear the sound of voices in unison on other occasions. Now, Sir Richard heard afterwards from the keeper of Sheen Gate that mothers with bewitched infants or with young children afflicted with whooping cough and other ailments often came sometimes from long distances to this tree and it was necessary that they should always arrive before sunrise. He even learned a snatch of the dog rule that was used in the ceremony. The babe passed nine times round that bar will never be bewitched. Many children were said to have been healed in this way, and as late as 1874, which was the year that M.R. James arrived in Temple Grove, the power of the tree was said to be used and believed in. But you see, it wasn't just children that could benefit from the sanitary magic of the shrew ash. What I'm going to read you now is a passage from Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne, which was published in 1789. And it almost reads to me like the kind of literary pastiche which M.R. James often indulged in. So, at the corner of the area near the church, there stood about 20 years ago a very old, grotesque, hollow pollard ash, which for ages had been looked on with no small veneration as a shrew ash. Now, a shrew ash is an ash whose twigs or branches, when gently applied to the limbs of cattle, will immediately relieve the pains which a beast suffers from the running of a shrew mouse over the part affected. For it is supposed that a shrew mouse is of so baneful and deleterious a nature that wherever it creeps over a beast, be it horse, cow or sheep, the suffering animal is afflicted with cruel anguish and threatened with the loss of the use of the limb. Against this accident, to which they were continually liable, our provident forefathers always kept a shrew ash at hand, which, when once medicated, would maintain its virtue forever. A shrew ash is made thus. Into the body of the tree, a deep hole was bored with an auger, and a poor devoted shrew mouse was thrust in alive and plugged in, no doubt with several quaint incantations long since forgotten. As the ceremonies necessary for such a congregation are no longer understood, all succession is at an end, and no such tree is known to subsist in the manor or hundred. And White goes on, the late vicar stubbed and burnt it when he was way warden, regardless of the remonstrances of the bystanders who interceded in vain for its preservation, urging its power and efficacy, and alleging that it had been religione patrum multos sovata per annos, which, of course, you will recognise as a quotation from the Aeneid. It had been preserved by the religion of our fathers for many years. And here, you see, I think, we get close to the world of M.R. James's The Ash Tree. Is Mrs. Mothersole a shrew mother? Now, she's seen to be cutting twigs from an ash tree in the middle of the night. She clearly has a close relationship with the local farmers who express great anxiety about the outcome of her trial. After her death, there is an outbreak of fatal disease among the local livestock. They're, they're presumably no longer under Mrs. Mothersole's protection. It's no wonder that the farmers are worried. And if Mrs. Mothersole is a shrew mother, what of her blood-sucking young ones? Now, shrews, Gilbert White tells us, were believed to be poisonous to the touch, that by simply running over the limbs of livestock, they could cause great pain and harm. Now, this is a belief that goes back as far as the ancient Greeks. Aristotle was aware of it. And the belief is reflected in the Latin name of the common shrew, Sorex Araneus. Sorex means shrew. Araneus means spider. The spider section referring to the supposed venomous nature of the rodent. 
So we have Shrew Mother, Spider Mother, Mrs. Mother Soul. Her young ones also suck up blood. Now, how much, if any of this, crossed the mind or fell within the ken of M. R. James, it's impossible to say. I think it's perfectly likely that there was a copy of Gilbert White's popular book in the Rectory Library at Livermere, and the use of ash trees for magical healing ceremonies was attested in rural Suffolk in the 19th century. The extraordinary-looking tree near Sheen Gate surely couldn't have escaped the attention of that inquisitive young lad on his visits to Richmond Park. The shrew ash was severely damaged in a storm in 1875, James's second year at Temple Grove. Did he perhaps go to view the fallen carcass? James probably wrote the ash tree in the late 1890s, more than 20 years after he'd left his prep school. Was he perhaps reminded of it by the article in Folklore in 1898? Or might it have lingered in his memory all that time? I like to think so. Because as well as writing and reading stories, it's clear that from a young age, Emma James enjoyed listening to stories and seeking stories out. And it seems perfectly likely to me that the story of Sir Richard Owen and the curious goings-on around his old ash tree would have come to his attention. And I can imagine him lying in the darkness in his dormitory in Temple Grove, brooding over the possibility that at that very moment, not half a mile away, there was a living, breathing witch going about her business among the branches of an ancient ash tree. 